We're going to be reading from Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18, which is on page 922 in the Black Bibles. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. This is the word of God. Therefore, beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is, good, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even as I am poured out as a drink offering upon the the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Father, again, as we now go to unpack your word, make it plain to us, and we give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Well, it's great to be back with you, especially after doing some life trekking. You uh, have had the opportunity to have a beautiful message last week. I hope if you're not able to be with us that you do take the time to go online and uh, listen to the message because it was really great. I really enjoyed listening to Brother Teague's message last week, and he unpacked four joys for us the joy of suffering, the joy of community, the joy of Christ, and the joy to come. And, you know, as we're talking about joy, we should understand that this is not just happiness. I mean, we, we know that joy is this word that even when you say it, uh, just say it with me on the count of three. You ready? One, two, three. Joy. Yeah, even as you say it, there's something about your lips that kind of makes a smile. You kind of feel better inside. But understand that what we're talking about is more than just a circumstantial uh, moment of happiness. We're really talking about a different position and posture of life. Which makes the fact that Paul, the apostle, is in prison writing to this church in Philippi, it makes it even that much greater to say he's not in a moment of earthly happiness that he would be drawing from. He's actually in a really difficult place. And so even last week, as was unpacked for us, uh, we're not like God. We're just not like him. Like God is so much different and better than us. And in fact, uh, even to think that there could be a God who is just good or just moral. Uh, I really appreciate that last week we unpacked and dissipated some of those myths that just would say God's just good and you're just trying to keep up and do good and be like him. It is so much more than that for us. So today, the title of our message is Light Living. And when we think about light... Forgive me as I leave the camera. As we think about light, I'm reaching for my illustration. We're not talking about L-I-T-E, like the kind of drink I should be drinking more of. We're talking about being light. Wonderful to be in God's house in this sanctuary that's designed with that in mind. No matter where you are in this room, you feel the presence of light. You can see it everywhere. There's a lot of light coming in. And the idea about, and this is deep for us, even when we think about being light, we don't walk into a room and say, oh, it's light. Let's just all stare at the lights. No, No, the light is there to illuminate. But our role is not to just look at light, it's to be light. 
So with that in mind, rule number one, keep illustrations far away from you in case they get involved. I'd like to have us take a look carefully at this passage and consider four items, three big ones, and then unpack the third one into several different points. We'll just call it a fourth point of how Paul is instructing us to be light. At our house, I don't know if you have a light switch like this, but there's a light that attaches to several things, and because of it, we just want the light to stay on all the time. We've lived in the house for several years, and I put this light bulb in, and it's attached to many other things. You put tape over that switch so nobody will accidentally turn it off because if that goes off, other things happen. But because of that, there is a light in our house that's been on for almost five years straight. I know on the package it says that the light will make it, right? It's a 15-year light. I know, but you and I know as many times as you've had to go and replace a light, it is rare that a light lasts. So every time I turn past that light, I just keep looking at it and think, are you still going? Are you still doing the thing that you're supposed to do? Are you still being light? As you prepared for the message last week, you sang a song, um, And Can It Be? The third verse says, He left his father's throne above So free, so infinite is grace, emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Point number one. Paul instructs God's people, to keep on keeping on. Paul says, if I were there with you, um, you would do your best. We have company coming to our house, and I don't know about you, but that's when things get done, right? You have company coming, there's something I was supposed to do, I didn't get to it, I'm going to get to it. They're not coming for a few hours, I got time. We're gonna, but I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. And Paul says to the church in Philippi, he says, listen, I'm absent from you, but even more in my absence than even in my presence, what I need you to do is to uh, not give in, not to back away, to keep on keeping on. In 1932, there's a little town in upstate New York called Lake Placid. And Lake Placid was the site. It's about... Uh, I don't know, 150 miles north of Albany, New York. And it was the site of the 1932 Olympics. So it was the Winter Olympics that was there. And, and then what happened after, which often happens, you know, when you have the Olympics somewhere, you build for the Olympics. So everything in that town at one point was built to try to both welcome the idea of having the Olympics, but also to take care of those who would come to the Olympics. But for... And remember, the Olympics happens every four years. So for seven years, for seven more cycles, they wanted to have the Olympics come back there. And each time, somebody else got the choice. In 1976, Denver was chosen for the 1980 Olympics. And of course, who wouldn't think that Denver wouldn't be a great place? But it's costly to have the Olympics there. And so Denver actually, in weighing the cost, said... We can't afford it. So they gave it up. Well, at that point, when Denver said no, what happened next was France, Canada, um, even uh, uh, Austria said, uh, Finland, sorry, said, we want to consider ourselves in the running for the Olympics. But this little town in upstate New York was chosen. And it was in the middle of many things. Remember, there was Tensions all over the world. We would have said we were in a Cold War for sure. There was a, a calls from the president at that time to uh, boycott the, the uh, Moscow Games. Um, there had been hostages taken in 1979. So because of this, there was just immense pressure. And, and Paul says, in light of those kind of things, be like uh, 
the people in Lake George and in Scroon Lake and in Lake Placid, this little community. Because all these people in that little community all said, you know what? We're going to do what we can to work it out. Even though it's a tough time, keep on keeping on. Your circumstances should not control your disposition. So in the book, even though he's in prison, he keeps saying these words, rejoice, 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 as if to say that the things that are going on with you in this present moment don't dictate the way you should feel and I should feel in spite of all that's happening around us. So when I look at this little tiny town, and if you get up to upstate New York, you ought to go drive through this little town. Because one of the cool things when you drive into the town is you see this humongous ski jump. And the first thing I realize is, you know, when, remember they used to do on the, on the uh, news, the thrill of victory, dun, 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 and the agony of defeat. And you saw this person just skating, you know, sailing off of that thing. We saw how big that lift is. But in spite of those things, those challenges, we are called to keep on keeping on. And so he says to the people here, look, I know that it's, it's a tough time, but just like if I was there, I need you to go clean up and get ready for me. I'm coming. I'll be there soon. Just go ahead and get things ready. Number two, Paul says, keep working out your salvation. Now, these words in this passage are complex because uh, we know that it's by grace that we're saved through faith, not of works. So if that's true, how is it that he says keep working out your salvation? Well, there's a temptation for us to live maybe not really for Christ. This Christ love and this Christ-like stuff is very expensive. It's costly and it's consuming. If you and I are going to actually live out our faith, there is a price to pay. And it's, engage, it's, it's, a, it's an engagement point that goes beyond our comfort levels. Maybe it is easier to live some other kind of life. I was thinking about the person who uh, shared Christ with me as a young man. I I know that most likely, and, and for most of us, if you would say that you have a relationship with Christ, in fact, you might not realize it, but most people actually have had multiple people trying to share with you about Christ. There have been multiple touches. And I'm thinking, and by the time you get to a place where you remember, oh, this is, this is when my relationship with Christ began, actually there are probably multiple touches that have already happened. Well, this family, they lived kitty corner to us on the next street and they open their home up to do child evangelism five-day clubs and I didn't want to go this particular day because I was afraid of dogs and the dogs were out and uh, I just remember this moment of thinking I, 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 I go to this little club and they tell me about Jesus but, you know, the dogs are in the neighborhood around, and I'm afraid of animals. So I'm just nervous about this. And so I went back home and decided I would just stay home. My dad, who I had a great visit with, by the way, thank you so much for your prayers, uh, both going out and coming back uh, and there. We had just so many stories. My dad had come home for the day, decided it was sunny out. He was going to take the day off of work. And so he came home, and here I was crying in the driveway. What's the matter with you, boy? Don't call me boy, but my dad called me. I said, well, the, the dog in the neighborhood, and I'm trying to describe what's happening. And he says, well, what are you doing? And I can't even get the words out. You know when you're crying so much, you just can't quite get the words out. So I'm crying, and he stands up and says, now listen. You get up and you get out there, get over it, wherever you were doing. He has no idea what I'm going to do. Whatever it is you're doing, go do it. Or you got to deal with me. And nobody wanted to deal with my dad. So, you know, when people say to me, how did your faith begin? I'm like, I was running for my life is what I was doing. <laughs> he said to me, work it out. I'm still trying. I can't get the words. I'm trying to deal with this. Go work it out. 
There is a portion. You know, Paul doesn't just say it here. He says it also in the book of Galatians. In Galatians, he tells us that we are to carry our own load. I love thinking back about our children and now our grandchildren and the things that you do for them. You know, I just know that carrying the kids is like the funnest thing. You, you carry them around, they play with your beard, they talk to you. It's just such a, well, ladies, you don't know about the beard. Anyway, it, it's a great thing. At some point, when our kids were really little, I would just carry them everywhere. It was just like a thing. It didn't matter. I didn't care how big they got. I'd carry them everywhere. Gina went away for a weekend, and so she's visiting with family, and I'm carrying our daughter around. And, you know, I didn't realize it, but my arm was starting to hurt. And so I was actually on my way to a church service, and I got to the church service, and I was carrying them. I I got them in my right arm. I'm carrying our our daughter, and I put her down, and someone shook my hand. And honestly, I really thought that my arm had broken. I, I, I pulled something in the arm and didn't know. So now with our daughter in tow, I've got to get to the hospital because I'm in such pain. And at some point in the hospital, you know, people ask you really good questions. And so they're asking you about what have you been doing and what's going on and what's happening. I'm trying to describe and explain how I've just, how this happened. I don't know. I actually thought that the guy shaking my hand did it. So I I was ready to blame. I went to church is what happened to me. I went to church. You go to church, stuff happened. The guy, I'm shaking his hand. Next thing you know, my arm is out of, I think it's out of the socket. I'm trying to explain. And finally, They said, is there anything else? I said, well, you know, my wife's been away. I've been carrying our daughter around. How old is your daughter? So I told them, and they said, does she walk? I said, well, yes. Well, why in the world aren't you letting her walk? Because there's a propensity to want to do everything for someone else. And so there is a call that God is putting out to us that says, it is not, maybe, maybe there's better language. Let me, let me give you better language. Keep living out your salvation. Keep living it out. This is not just that Christ died for me, oh glory for this, and now I do nothing and he does everything. He's done everything, praise the Lord, the most sacrificial sacrifice there could be, the best thing that could happen. We're going to celebrate it again in just a few minutes. He's done everything. Now, what do I do? Well, nothing. Maybe I'll go to church on Sunday. I don't know. But but, but what's the part that I'm supposed to do? There is a live out that should happen to every day. There should be this living out of what's going on. And so he says... Work out your salvation. How? Respectfully. With fear and trembling. As we traveled back across the country, 17 hours of driving. (laughs) It's a good thing we liked each other. It's good. As we traveled across, you know, some things you can count. And on a holiday weekend, what you can count are how many state troopers there are across the country. Traveling from Massachusetts to New York to Pennsylvania to Ohio to Indiana. I can tell you I have never seen so many police cars. And each time I've got the cruise control set, I'm not speeding. But I have to tell you, when I turned the corner and saw the cruiser parked on the side of the road, fear and trembling and the brake. What is it that gets your attention? What gets your attention? I recall serving in a church during the time that there were um, tensions happening around the country related to race and ethnicity. And uh, we were thinking about how, how, how do we respond to this as a church, or could this be a problem that we have to deal with? And at one point, we decided that we wanted to have the congregation said, well, first of all, the congregation said, hey, listen, pastor, we all carry. So we're good. We'll, we'll protect the church. So now, we, you know, we're talking about it. I said, so everybody says, we'll bring our guns to church, pastor. We got you. So we began to think about it. I said, well, you know what? I think, actually, tell you what. I mean, think about talking about elder duties, right? I, mean, we, I said, well, why don't we do this? 
why don't we call on people who this is their job? They get up every morning prepared to take care of people. Why don't we call them and ask them to help us? And so um, we had officers there, and when they came, you know, we get to church early as, as this morning. Everyone's getting ready for the day, and this cruiser pulls up and underneath the uh, front portico there, and uh, he gets out of the car. The officer gets out, and he, he says, uh, Pastor, where, where do you want me to park? I said, Brother, I want you to park your thing right there. I'm pretty sure I want everybody to have to walk around your cruiser. I said, you can leave the lights on if you want. And so, you know, later we became friends. You know, we got to know each other. And at some point, he actually did, I thought it was funny. He said, I'm just going to leave my, my low lights on. And, and so people came to church and, you know, they kind of came in like this. Like, is everything okay? Oh, yeah, everything's good. We're just working it out. We're working out the best we can. On one particular morning, I recall after receiving a, uh, an unexpected call and not sure what to do. Do we have church? It sounds like maybe there could be a problem. The officer came in that morning, and uh, I said to her, uh, I'm kind of concerned, officer. Um, the situation's going on. And uh, I loved her response. I always remembered her response. She said to me, Pastor... You have a job to do, and I have a job to do. You go do your job, I'm going to do my job. Wow. Christians, we have a job to do. Christ has done his job. Y'all go do your job. We know what it is. Let's, let, let, let's, sorry. let's not act like we don't know what our job is. We do know what our job is. As I'm standing there in my yard, crying, my dad's like, what are you doing? You know how to walk. Go, you know how to walk. Get over to wherever it is you were going. You know what to do. You know what to do. You go do what you got to do. As believers, Paul is imploring, begging the church at Philippi. As he is in prison, you go do what you do. You know what you got to do. Go do it. The third point is that we would model joyous living. I said this third point is almost like a fourth point because there's two points inside here that he says that I'm just like, I don't even know what to do with these. They're, they're not separate points. They are two, they're two points that are connected. And Paul says uh, to, to them, lose two particular things. Lose them. Get rid of them. Lose them. These cannot be brought on as carry-on luggage. I don't know if you've got a chance to fly recently. I fly. And I can tell you the size of the bag, the size of this change. If you want to get free luggage, don't check the box off too early that you have luggage. Wait for them to ask you. Then they'll tell you that you can bring your luggage. There's all kinds of rules, but there's certain things that right now you got to lose. You can't bring those things on carry-on luggage. Believer, we have two things that Paul says we should lose, and they're interesting items. He says, do all things without grumbling and disputing. Now, he uses a word in this passage where he says, um, in verse 14, he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. But the word that he uses is a little word, all. He says, do all things. On the count of three, just say it with me. One, two, three. All, yeah, all things, not some things, all things. And, and it's a good word, panta, in the Greek, it is all, all is all. And he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. The word uh, gongamzon uh, means muttering. It even sounds like a mutter, gongamzon, gongamzon. He says, don't mutter. When he's talking about muttering, what he's really talking about, you and I understand this, because when we mutter what we're doing, and this is what he's stating, he's stating that the, these actions will rob, dissipate, snatch, steal, and pull away your joy. So it's not enough to do the good thing with actually the wrong reason in your mind. It is not enough to say, hey, I'm going to do the right thing, but under my breath, actually, I have an opposite thought of the thing I'm doing. And 
And then he goes on and he uses this other word, dialogus, logic, dialogus, reason. Wait a minute. Do all things without thinking? That's exactly what he says. As a soldier, as, as an officer, as someone serving underneath authority, when the authority tells us what to do, we just do it. There was this moment as we're driving, and again, 17 hours. I'm very glad that we got to do it together. But after 17 hours, I wonder how shaky my driving actually is. So I'm driving along, and we've got off the road for a little stretch of the legs and stand up, and we get back on the highway, but I don't even know the road I'm on. I'm following that little voice in, on the dashboard. And at one point, as I'm turning onto an, an entry point, all of a sudden, I hear my sister yell, Do not enter! Well, I, I look up suddenly, and I see two signs that say, Do not enter! And what I'm not sure of is, are those signs for me or for the people on the other lane? I just, it's just in that moment that someone says, stop. You have to decide, are you going to do this? Now, when I was little, she used to tell me what to do all the time. We'd be sitting at a table having a meal, and, um, you know, you go out to eat, and people don't realize that you're little, so they put the fork and the knife and the spoon for you, just like everybody else, but I was little, and so my first eye was heading to the knife, and so she would quietly take away the knife from me, and I couldn't get my words out, so all I would say is, give me back my life. Give me back my life. I couldn't get the words out, so even now, sometimes, I do hear her muttering, give me, you want your life back? But in that moment when she said, stop, my foot went to the brake. And there was no time to think. Now, the person behind me probably is a little frustrated because we were on the right road. But I did see the sign, too. And, you know, I wish they would just tilt it just a little bit so you can't see it. But I saw it that said, do not enter. So I had to make a decision immediately to follow without thinking. This, for us, is what God's saying. He says in this passage, don't, don't mumble, don't mutter, and don't even think about it. Don't reason. We have a friend, and I share this story because the friend shared this deep story with me. One day at a stoplight, this friend is somebody who listens to God all the time really, really follows the Lord. But at a stoplight, they see a person that looked like he was in need and felt the absolute tug to do something. And in that moment, just said, what can I do? The light's going to change shortly and began to look around and saw that she had one left-handed glove on her seat. And so she went to reach for the seat for the glove. But then she thought, that is the silliest thing. I can't find the other glove. So the lights now on the other side are changing, right? So what, what do I do? Well, she just sat there for a second. The light changed, and she began to drive because the cars were coming behind. It was a busy road. As she drove past the person, she noticed that he had a right-handed glove, but no left-handed glove. And so the reminder is in this moment, as she was trying to logos this, logic out this thing, Actually, we missed the moment. This sounds so counterintuitive to say that what God's calling us to do is to stop thinking, but let me go deeper with you and just say, just stop out thinking God. So we would all agree that God is great. Amen? Amen. We would all agree that God is greater than you. Amen? You, you look at me and say, God's greater than me, right? Amen? So then at what point do we feel that we have our call is to outthink him? Well, if he's greater than me, I already know his ways are greater than my ways. His thoughts are greater than my thoughts. So therefore, I can't keep up with his thoughts. My arms are too short to box with God. Well, what is it that I'm trying to think about? He's giving clear direction. He says here, don't, don't mutter don't dispute. So how do I do that? I mean, what's the practical takeaway? I mean, if we were going to actually, I could say to you just don't do that. 
That's the way we often get instructions. But how? How do I practically not, not do that? Let's just look at a couple of ways as we prepare to close. Four ways to not mutter or dispute. First of all, manage your mind. I've got to manage my mind. G-I-G-O. Good stuff in, good stuff out. Garbage in, garbage out. In Philippians, later in the book, it says, in chapter 4, Finally, brothers, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. You and I have a responsibility to manage our mind. I can't control every thought that flies over my head, but I don't have to let it make a nest in my hair. Secondly, Pick your company well. Proverbs 13 reminds us that whoever walks with the wise is wise. Pick my company well. Sometimes when I was uh, wanting to get a deal, I would say these words. I'd lean over the counter while I'm making a purchase and say, they're asking you, is there anything else that you want? Do you want the extended warranty? I'd say, well, no, what I want is a PPD. They said, I'm sorry? I said, a PPD. That's a poor preacher discount. <laughs> they would laugh and then give me a deal. One time I got a free ticket, an airline that way. But then a friend said to me, who I picked wisely, hey, Greg, you know you live in America, right? Not one car, but two. I've never seen you even wear the same clothes twice. Do you really think that what you're saying that's coming out of your mouth is consistent with who you are and who God has made you to be? I have to tell you, that I needed to pick my friends wisely. I needed someone to say that to me because people got used to saying, hey, hang out with Dyson, watch this. He's going to ask for a PPD and we're going to get a deal. Now, don't get me wrong. I still want the deal. <laughs> but at least if you're going to ask for something as a believer, should we not be authentic? Excuse me, is there anything less I can get on this? I don't deserve it, but I sure would like it. It's a more honest statement. Rather than hanging out with people that would encourage you in the bad activities, choose your friends wisely. People that are going to hold you accountable. We, you know, we used to have a, a couple of people that would come to our church, and um, I remember that many of them, some of them, lived, didn't have a place to live. So if you don't have a place to live, um, lots of things are complicated, including showers. So if you happen to be sitting near somebody that doesn't have a place to live, you might know that without them telling you that. And, uh, and on, on Sundays, what would happen is, not, like any, like many, not this Sunday, but any time we get together to worship, those were long days for me. I get up early in the morning, and I run late at night. So the clothes that I wear, they got to get me all the way through the day. But, you know, if you hug somebody who doesn't have a place to live, you probably are going to know that you were with them even five or six hours from now. So what I started doing was during those moments of meet and greet, I would greet but go in the other direction. And man, I'm a friendly person, so you know people want to hug me. So they're looking for me. And one day I found myself kind of working through the crowd. There they are. I'm heading this way to kind of get around. And someone pulls me aside and said, hey, I see that. I see you, Pastor. I see what you're doing. You're trying not to live out your faith. That's the kind of friend that you need. You need that kind of friend. Hang with those people. Lean in to those people. Sometimes, you know, even people who will tell you the truth, it, it's a little painful. And you might actually be thinking in your mind, I'm actually moving away from that person too. No, actually, that person is really helpful, helpful to you and me. We should lean in and the encouragement would be, pick your company well. Third, when there is a large problem that needs changing, talk to the highest authority. Now, this is a church spoiler, 
So I'm going to ask you a question, and it's a church answer I'm expecting. If you understand this, shake your head, okay? I'm going to ask you a question. It's a church answer, okay? We good? Okay, good. Yeah. So here's the question. Who's the highest authority possible? Thank you very much. Yeah, God is the highest authority possible. So why am I messing around talking with other people about my problems? <laughs> I mean, really, like, just to think about this for a second. It's not that we shouldn't confess our sins one to another. James tells us that we ought to. But we also know that we need to be talking to the highest authority. I can come grumble and complain to you about a situation and never talk to God about it. So do I want to actually fix the situation or just whine about it? I mean, let's think about the things we might whine about. I don't know about you, but... Boy, I can whine about politics, whine about the weather. I can whine about lots of things, but actually, there's many, most of those things, I can't do anything with my whining that will change any of those circumstances. In fact, a better attitude, a move for me to make would be to say, if I'm concerned about this thing enough that it's coming out of my mouth, then it should be going vertical and talking to God about it. 1 John chapter 5 says, and this is the confidence we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know he hears us, then whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. This passage has been wrongly thought of as being this uh, ask and get passage, one where I would just say, well, I'm going to ask God and he'll give it to me because the Bible says so. Actually, what it says is you and I should have such an intimate relationship with God that we begin to think each other's thoughts after it each other. This morning, as I was leaving, I reached for my keys, and I thought to myself, you know, you, you're going to preach, and those bulky things in your pocket are already messing up your back. You don't need to have anything in your pocket. You should probably take your wife's key off the ring. But I didn't do anything about it. Just a thought. About 20 minutes ago, my wife called and said, do you have the backup keys to my car? Because I need those keys. I don't have them. Oh. Isn't it great when you could say, I've been with somebody long enough that actually we begin to think each other's thoughts pretty regularly. This passage is saying that you get so intimate with God that you begin to think thoughts like he's thinking, because you're thinking his thoughts after him. It's not that you're just asking God willy-nilly for anything. You're actually asking God for what his will is for your life anyway, because you, he knows what he wants to do in your life, and you're beginning to get close to him, so you're beginning to understand what you should be asking for, what you should be wanting in your life, because it's already what God wants in your life. Finally, I want to stop murmuring, murmuring and disputing. Keep track of God's results. I love this because, you know, God has got great results. This helps us understand what was going on with the apostle. The apostle is in prison. He's in jail. But he actually is seeing something different because he says, you know, after all, God is 100 for 100. He keeps getting it right. No matter what seems to happen, somehow God works it out. This thing that he writes about later in Romans chapter 8 when he says, listen, somehow God's working it all out for good. For those who love him and are called according to his purpose, he's laying out this picture that says what? God's good. And because he's good, you can trust him. And because you can trust him, even the thing that looks bad from this standpoint actually has somehow the ability for God to turn that around and to do something else with it. So as Paul is in prison... Locked up. He says, Woohoo! Opportunity in prison to share the gospel. I'm over here and the whole palace is hearing about it because I've got the palace guard and they're gossipers anyway. They're sharing all the news. How can he turn imprisonment even into a good thing? Because he serves a God who is not like us, he's not limited. So everything has an opportunity for Christ. As you prepare this week for the things that you're going back to, the things, some things you've laid down because it's the weekend you've laid, but now, you know, I got to pick those things back up on Monday. As you go back to those things in the week, know this, what looks good, what looks bad, what looks complicated, God has the ability to impact that thing. Your joy is not dependent on the circumstance that you are in. 
And what message would that send to the world around us when they see how it is we're actually enjoying life at a different level? Not enjoying the problem, but enjoying the God who created you and able to get you and I through more than we can imagine. Yes, we can have joy. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for the power of your word. It's difficult, Lord, in the world that we live in to remember that we didn't create it, that you did, and that you're able. So God, even in this world, that we have the propensity, desire, and want to murmur and complain, give us a new perspective on life. Give us the opportunity to rethink how we'll live today. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.